Welcome to The Life. I'm your host, Larry Mazza, and each week I will be bringing you a guest that has lived the life or has been affected by the tentacles of the life, also known as Cosa Nostra. Tonight, I have a dear old friend, Frank, Frankie Steele Pontillo. Frankie, good to see you. Good to see you, brother. We got a lot to talk about uh, things you're doing. So It's a different type of sit down. Yeah, yeah, yes. You know, but it's good. Different type of sit down. Why don't we start by you telling the audience how you got into the life? It all starts in Brooklyn, where we grew up, right. naturally. You know, Brooklyn was the breeding ground for La Costa Nostra. All five families right. came from Brooklyn. You know, then you have Queens, Manhattan, right. Bronx, but Brooklyn was the heart of everything. Right. So was there a father figure or somebody like that? There usually is. That's why I ask. Well, again, it goes back to where you grow up. Mm -hmm. And you see things that other neighborhoods don't. And you see guys on every corner. Like in the 80s, you saw there was a social club on every other corner. You know, walking to school, you pass four different clubs from four different families. And now you get to see these guys every day and you become familiar with them. And you make small talk with them. And you get mesmerized by it. Right. You see the fancy cars, you see the nice clothes, and you you kind of look up to them. They're also noticing you. Yes. They notice you, they see characteristics or traits. They tend to see a guy that has a good family behind him, a good background, uh, that they can see that they can teach, they can school, they can groom. Yes. Make you loyal to them. And little by little, they ask you to do things. Yes. That's how it was for me, and I would imagine for yes. you too. Well, they, they, they see what you're capable of at a young age. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, good fellow material, mm -hmm. or if you just knock around guy material, or right. what you could do. Yeah. And you, you're tested young. And like, say for me, like my particular situation, you know, my father, you know, did a lot of years in prison. You know, when he got out, he did four prison bids that equaled up to 52 years he did. Wow. So, you know, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. on the last one, he was in 27 years on the last one before he died. And a lot of the guys in the neighborhood knew I was Sammy's son. So that already put me a little above right. the other younger guys. Exactly. And, you know, they know once you're, you you have that in your blood, mm -hmm. that that might be one of the good puppies to yeah. get. Not, the, not one of those small little runt puppies. That's a good puppy to pull from the exactly. litter. Exactly. Yeah, I had a, a mutual friend that I grew up with. Mm-hmm. His cousin was Bobby Zam. Right. And then I got close with his kids. And being close with his kids brought us into meetings that, you know, other guys didn't, you know, were part of. And one thing led to another, being around him, you start doing things for him. And I remember there was a time where a guy owed money on a furniture store. Mm -hmm. And Bobby told his son, yeah, go get the money from that guy, but take the fat kid with you. You know? So... Uh and that was it. I went and did my thing at the furniture store. They got the money. I wrecked the place, basically, and uh, and that started everything. That starts it. They see you capable of that. Next time, they give you a little bit more. Now you got to hurt the person, not so much the furniture in the place. But it even goes before that. Yeah. As far as with Greg. Mm -hmm. So I remember like, when you're in school, you have to sell candy. All right? right. You know, you get the chocolate bars in the box, yeah. you got to buy mm -hmm. it. So not naturally, one of the stops was the club. You know, when you're in your junior high school, you stop at the club and then you get everybody to buy candy. Greg bought it all, but he gave me, which I didn't know at the time, was all counterfeit money. <laughs> okay? Yeah, no And heart. I turned that into the school. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And they called me in. The Secret Service was in the school. Unbelievable. They were like, Where, where'd you get this from? I said, I don't know. I sold it to guys in the street. I never said, yeah, I got it from Greg, you know? And But I went and told Greg this. And he says, oh, you did good. And he threw me some real money. Yeah. You know, but that always stuck out. Yeah. That's how. That's how. What kind of guy he was? He was into counterfeiting too. No, I didn't he know. He was that. buying the Girl Scout cookies. Everybody would stop him, all with the fake money. Um, I don't know how. They they probably did find out because now what we know now, mm -hmm. when he was with the government, you know, right? Maybe they did approach him on it and said, "Stop buying the kids cookies with the counterfeit money." Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's when counted hundreds were going through the whole neighborhood. Yeah. You know, it's before. a good segue because yeah, we had some good times. Uh, we both had to do things we regret today. Yeah. But again, you're in the life, you don't produce or you show weakness, you're not going to be around long. Listen, Greg, yeah. if you ate a powdered donut on the way to the club, 
and there was a little white powder from the sugar. Right. And he thought you were doing drugs. Yeah. You were quietly murdered. You right. You know that. Yeah. Yeah. You rolled up in a rug. How many rugs came out yeah, of that club? No, absolutely. With everybody inside it. Yep. 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 I witnessed him shoot a guy named Donnie for calling him a rat. Now, you can do that. Somebody calls you a rat, you can shoot him. But a lot of us wouldn't do that. We'd go confront the guy, maybe crack him around, or say, don't talk that way ever again, or I'm going to kill you. Greg pulled the gun out and shot him right between the eyes. Listen, when he came out throwing the wall mm -hmm. with Jerry Capici, yep. remember? Yep. He wanted to stop all killing and go kill Jerry Capici. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. You know, he told me once he stopped counting at 50. Later on, I've heard it was the numbers a lot higher. I saw him in gas pipe while we were away together, all three of us, arguing about the hits and the robberies that were done in the neighborhood, who had more. Listen, I was on the floor when Gas Pipe came in, yeah. when he got locked up, mm -hmm. and Greg came in when he got his eyes right. shot out. Yeah, we were playing cards. It was a crazy time. Yeah. What we're segueing into here, perfect time, is the war. You know, would knock the whole Colombo family out. Junior Persico was the boss, Carmine the Snake. Yeah. As you know, Frankie. And he got a 60-something years, oh, 130 100, years. 139 sentence. years. So it's, it's life. He's not coming home. He was already in his mid-60s when this happened. So he picks a guy named Vic Arena to be the acting boss. I remember Greg telling me that was a weak decision right there because he thought he could control Vic. That's why he put him there. He was right, but everybody controlled Vic. And Vic was misled by... But Vic was a nice guy. He was a nice guy. I, I liked him. He was a nice guy, but uh, he wasn't really boss material because if somebody came to you, if you were the boss, or you were running Greg's, you're acting on his behalf, and somebody came and told you, we're going to take this thing over, you're going to tell him, take a walk before I kill you right here because you're not going to do you're, it. You're referring... To like John Gotti was in Vic's. Well, that's was, one of them. Was, that's one of them. Yes, John Gotti was one. He should have told John, mind your business. I'll run my family. You know, I, I remember that. John Gotti was an equal. He was, wasn't was bigger than Vic. He was, well, he was official. He wanted but, to be. Yeah, but he wanted to be the boss of bosses. Yeah. So uh, other guys in the family that had gripes with Junior over the years sided with Vic. And now we wind up in a bloody, violent war that should really have never happened. And Frankie and I were back to back, side by side, gun to gun, uh, getting shot at, shooting guys. Uh, so, I mean, it was a nightmare to me. When I think back at that time in my life, mm -hmm. it's like a book I read. Because how do we even be involved in the, the insanity that we were involved in? See, they don't understand. Greg was a special kind of animal. Mm -hmm. Okay. The worst of the, of the worst of the worst. And he was playing both sides. And we didn't know. We're learning from a lunatic mm -hmm. who's working with the government. Right. Who had a green light to do what he was doing. And they couldn't even control him. Yeah. But we had no idea. No. We didn't know. We thought this guy was so tough and brazen and had... Everybody in his pocket. Cajones, yeah. like, yeah. you know, the biggest ever. And still, to do the things he did, it takes something. But he had that edge. He had but that again, edge. Again, Larry, the things he did in broad daylight yes. in front of hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. See, there was no cell phones back then. Right. Do you realize he'd be viral yeah. right now? There'd be 100, 200 videos of him murdering people Yeah. because everybody's got a phone. Yeah. It was a crazy time. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. You know, you couldn't get away with that now. But it sh our attendance should have went up, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. If you remember now, you know, during the war, a lot of people were murdered. Remember Vinnie Venus? Yeah. Okay, he was hanging his Christmas lights, mm -hmm. and Greg shot him. I was him. right there. Okay. Yeah. He used the M1. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the rule is, if you're going to use a gun on somebody, you have to get rid of it afterwards. Right. Okay. Fast forward a few weeks later, I go on something with him in Long Island. You and Jimmy were there, but you was in different cars. Mm -hmm. It was me, Carmine, Greg, and a right. couple other people. And we were getting somebody over there. Okay. I just want to say his last name. I'll say his first name, Patty. Which is another mm -hmm. good guy. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm sitting in the car with him now. Again, now you're a kid. You're mesmerized. You know, now a war is happening. Now you prove yourself. Now you're going to go up in the ranks. Right. So you're going to do anything you have to do. And if you don't, he's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the back of the car with him. And he pulls out the M1. Where's his favorite? The same one from the few weeks before. Mm -hmm. So now I'm saying to myself, did this guy using the same thing? 
Like he's right. he, isn't throw it away because it looks like it's been around for fifty years. It was. It was all nooks, nooks and crannies taken out. It had like little notches on it, like it was counting. Yeah, it was from like a war, a real war. But American it had like Army notches. War. Look, right on the side, notches with a line going through, like it was counting the bodies on it. So now I'm looking at this in the cars. We're driving, and we're getting closer to where it's going to take place. And I'm saying it. it why ain't this guy throwing the gun away? What does he have that he can do this? He thinks he could keep it. So now afterwards, after everything goes down, I say, Carmine, you know, he was the concierge of the family, Carmine Sessa. So right, yep. I says, that's the same gun he used already. It looks like he used it multiple times. Mm -hmm. He goes, keep that to yourself. And that was it. So I didn't say nothing, and it just went about my day and about my life. But uh, the antennas went up there. Yeah. It was, how could he do this? I was still too... In awe of the man, thinking that he was he the had like man. a green light to do whatever yeah. he was doing. Because yeah. I remember now, when anybody got six 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 on their beeper, mm -hmm. that meant somebody's dead. Right. But we knew to meet at that strip club in New Jersey. That was all yeah. the time. Yep. Yep. Within two hours, and not get followed to, to to go see what happened. Right. And if you remember, I remember I met you there one day. Mm -hmm. Now, see how you never threw a gun away. Yeah. You used that little white car station wagon thing multiple times because. On one shooting, I don't know who it was, somebody died, but when you came to the strip club parking mm -hmm. lot and you parked your car and we talked a little bit and then you rolled away, I saw the, there was dripping paint. Somebody rolled the car a different color with different paint. We had it painted a few times. Yeah, I but don't it, know if it was a roller. took house paint and Re oh, really? <laughs> it looked like it was dripping in the yeah. parking lot. <laughs> and I said to myself, now they're not throwing the car away. Yeah. Usually you burn the car afterwards. You blow it up, something. They're using the same gun, not the same car. It's just a different color. I know. I know. And you wonder, like, yeah, technically, but what's really happening here? Yeah. So that leads to the other guys that were around with him for so many years. Why didn't they see this? Or were they? They had to. You know, if you think back of all the situations, all the murders, mm -hmm. all the attempted murders, all the cases... What kind of luck did this guy have? Yeah. But you would think, since it's Greg, you know, the Grim Reaper, who's high in the family, mm -hmm. has a lot of respect, gets the job done, because he pays, you think he's got all these people on the payroll. Mm -hmm. Because if something came out when he and said that he was bad, he automatically killed somebody within 24 hours of right. that, and right. it would clear your mind. Yeah. Because you say, okay, this guy can't be bad. He just killed this guy in broad daylight in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. Or else, you know, if he's bad, we're all going away forever. Right. You know, and it was, it was a crazy time. Yeah. No, absolutely. And then I look back and I'm like, prison, going to prison saved us because there would have been a, a, a hit crew cleaning up the mess afterwards. There was a while where I felt relieved being in the camp. It was a relief. You know? Yeah. You know, people looking at your size, you're a big guy. They, they wouldn't expect you to be such a motorcycle daredevil. But you were a daredevil. And, and tell us about that chase. I mean, it's a historic three-state chase. No, uh, it was a crazy time. All right, so let's go back. It was, oh, let's go back a little bit. I've been riding dirt bikes my whole life. Right. And before I got big. Okay. You know, in size. And, uh, you know, when I say dirt bikes, that's, you know, in the streets, on the trails, jumps. I was doing it all. Mm -hmm. That day was, it was June 10th, 1991. The war's full blown going right. on. All right. There's already been about a dozen bodies and probably yeah. and uh, 30 woundings. They're starting to arrest guys. People are getting arrested. Site, right. And I had my motorcycle thrown in the world a lot. Mm -hmm. And when the agents would try to chase me and follow me, I always would spot them out and they would chase me around the highway and we would like race. It became like a game to me and these certain agents. Right. That day, we went and got sausage at the butcher shop. And we were barbecuing in, in the backyard of Joe Brains' house. It was me, Joe Brains, Richie Brady, and Mike DiMatteo. You know them all, mm -hmm. okay? And I went with the bike to go get more Italian bread. You know, so I, I got the Italian bread on the handlebar, and I'm driving back to the house, and I see agents. Right. So I come back to the house. I go in the backyard. You know, they're in the pool. He's barbecuing. I go, listen, put the soldiers on top and leave it open so you don't cook. I gotta go show you something right now. So we end up going and jumping into Joe Brains' car and we go now and I go, listen, I just saw agents watching your house. We go to where they are, they're not there. I go, listen, I'm telling you, the agents are here. Now, 
He goes, agents are here? I said, yeah. He goes, well, my trunk has a bag full of guns. We have to get rid of them. So we pull over to this wooded area. I get out and I take the bag. I put it by a tree. We get back in the car. And now we start to drive around. We see a couple agents. Now they're like trailing us. They go back to the house. And they go back in the backyard. They go, we're not doing nothing. The torches are burning. Not really, you know, they don't care that the agents are out there following us around. The torches are going to burn. <laughs> so we go back to the house. Now I'm biting into my sandwich and I'm like, what if somebody finds those guns? So I take two more bites. I go, I got to go get the bag. So I get on the motorcycle. I go to where the bag is. I put the bag you know, on my shoulder, it's like a like a duffel bag. It's all pistols. It's not rifles. Mm -hmm. It's all pistols and, and the submachine guns and stuff. So I'm and I'm driving back. As I'm driving back, I'm passing the Staten Island Mall Park a lot, and I see, you know, like we the uh, agents get ready to do s some type of a, uh, you know, warrant or mm -hmm. gonna bust someone. They're you. all getting ready in the park mm -hmm. a lot, putting their vests on, putting their FBI jackets, and I'm driving by. I'm like, they're gonna arrest somebody today. Not thinking it's going to be us in a couple of minutes. Yeah. So I go back to the house. And as I go back to the house, there's another car. The ones that usually chase me around mm -hmm. is following me. So I just take off and I go back to Joe Brains' house. As I pull up to the house, his wife comes out. I hand her the guns. I say, here, take these and hide them. Oh, yeah, yeah. As I said, hide them, Larry, they came out of every nook and cranny on this block. Vans, cars, a, a, a police dog that the guy was walking was really a police dog that they, they let loose on me, all right? But I just turned the bike and went down the block with the dog chasing me. And when I got to the corner, they, they cut me off. I went around them and that started a high-speed chase that went from Staten Island into Jersey where I said, if I didn't ever die that day, I'll never die because the speeds that I was reaching and what they were prepared now, they went and got a Mustang and a Corvette to keep up with me. They had it in their little arsenal of cars and they were actually trying to kill me that day. They were trying to crash into me and they end up crashing. I didn't and, know that. Yeah, they end up crashing and there was about 30 cars chasing mm -hmm. me down Richmond Avenue onto the highway. And then out of nowhere, a helicopter. So I'm swooping down over me on the Korean Expressway. And that's when I just nailed it. And I was going the fastest I ever went on the bike ever. You know, your adrenaline's yeah. pumping. Yeah. I'm buried on the gas tank. It's buried at 180 miles an hour. So my bike is winding out. It sounds like it's gonna explode. And I'll never forget, I passed a car at that speed that I was going. Of course, my bike was all worked on, modified. Right. You know, it was a race bike. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a convertible with two people in it. I saw their heads and a dog. That's all I saw. And in the rearview mirror, I passed them at such a high speed, they went right off the road. I must have startled them. Oh my God. And they went right there. I saw in the mirror, they didn't go right that like that. I must have like, they must have been nervous. Yeah, like a, a, that's, a, I, I get nervous when I motorcycle. Like a fighting, like like a fighter jet just went by. Right, me. unbelievable. Now I come down to where you're gonna come to the toll, there's a roadblock. And I wasn't stopping. Even though I should have, I wasn't. And I went through it. And I just went through it. The two cars, they were just in line. And I went through that roadblock. It broke the fairings on the side. They cracked and came flying off, but I still went through it. And then they had Jersey cops waiting for me on the other side of the bridge. I went through that roadblock. And then the, Jer the, the Jersey started chasing me with the agents and the helicopter. And now as you're doing this, you're trying to think, how am I going to get away? I'm just keep making sure I'm not running out of gas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the movies, you see people, they go into a building or they go under a tunnel. And right. but it, So I'm thinking, where can I go? And now the mall on Route 1 over there, that's what's coming to my head. I go, if I can get into that mall before they get there, I can get out. I can get away here. And that's what I did. I ended up making it to that mall. Uh -huh. And I jumped off the bike right in front. And I went in the mall and there was like a sporting store. I was taking the clothes as off the rack, like Jason Bourne. I was changing as I was walking. And I made it to the other side of the mall and jumped in a cab. Yeah. 
Those, you that, know, and, and that's when I became a fugitive that day. Right. That's that's a chase scene like Bullet, Steve McQueen. It, it was a, it was the craziest scene in my life. But thank God, like it's like I've been prepping my whole life of riding for that one day. Because everything that I knew had to come out that day. Then soon after, you got arrested and they blew up your door. Well, no, no they blew up the door later on after oh. I came home. This was Now, when I got arrested there, I got arrested maybe, that was June. I got arrested in September. And they were ready for me this time. And I, I was at a place I shouldn't have been. I was at a video shoot and whatnot. And yeah, and uh, I shouldn't have been there. You're on the lamb and you're on a video shoot? I was filming a music video. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah, it's another story. But we're filming the music video, and uh, 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 this guy, Corio, comes over to me. I'm still friends with him to this day. And he comes over to me and says, uh, the FBI's outside. I said, they don't know I'm here. You know, I'm surrounded with all singers. This is when Mary J. Blige just came out, and it was Joe DeC was there, Q-Tip, uh, Teddy Riley, a couple of uh, reggae uh, singers, Sugar Hill Gang, Oh. They're, all, they're all there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no one knows I'm here. So now I'm filming the scene, you know, because they needed a mob guy in the thing. So I'm filming the scene. And uh, he comes to me and says, they know you're here. I go, how do you know? He goes, they got your picture at the front door. So now I tell my friend Eddie, get your Mustang and put it on the side door. I want to make a run for it. You might not get it back. <laughs> so now I send him out the back door of the restaurant we were filming. As soon as he got like past like the two gates, he was tackled. All right. So now I just start barricading the door. Like the guys are chopping vegetables. I'm dragging the whole vegetable prep station. I'm barricading the door, the garbage cans, the pots that are hanging on the thing. I'm barricading the whole door. And the, 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 all the Mexican guys are looking at me like, what's going on here? <laughs> and uh, I ended up getting pinched that day. They actually get, find me in the basement, you know, like an hour later. Mm -hmm. I almost got out, but I needed to change clothes. And I told this guy, Corey, I said, get me some other clothes. I can't be in the suit. He came back with a farmer's outfit. You know, like the overalls? Yeah. <laughs> I go, I'm not even going to get arrested like this. I'd rather get arrested with this on right now than try to get away with the farmer's outfit. You know? That would have been the laughing stock yeah. of gangland. You know, of imagine course. that mugshot with the yeah. strap and everything. Yeah. So I, I wasn't having it. Not a newspaper would have passed. But it destroyed day. me. Yeah. I, I would have yeah. rather got, you know, exactly. arrested. And no, I, I know the feeling. Yeah, so I waited until they actually found me. The dog found me. But it didn't bite me, thank God. It found me. And they go, you thought you were going to get away with the Mustang, right? I was like, yeah. All I needed was to get into that car. He wasn't going to get me. And that was the joke all the way to MCC. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? That's how that night ended, yeah. you know? And that's when I be, you know, ended so, up at MCC. So now later on in life is when SWAT came. Oh, yeah. We oh, got to hear that. That's this a is after I came home and was home a while. You remember in 2011? January something, it was Mafia Takedown Day. Mm -hmm. They went and arrested 127 right, mob right. guys at the same time at six o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. While I was on that list, ah. I heard my gate close. So you know, you're know you in tune to everything around you. Being in the hole, being in jail, you you know who's walking to your cell before they get there. Being in the life, and, even and on the street, yeah, yeah. You're already being in a life for prison, but now you start hearing things and being attuned to other senses that you never were in tune to. So I hear the gate crinkle. So that's why I get up. So I know somebody just came in the gate. Who's coming to my house at six o'clock oh, yeah. in the morning? So now I just walk over to the, my bedroom. My, my, my dog had its own bedroom. So I go to my dog's bedroom. Now his eyes, his ears are open. He's listening. Mm -hmm. So I know somebody's coming. So now I look at the thing and I look down and I see down the whole steps. They're all holding on their shoulder. It's all SWAT in the gear. Oh my God. So now I run. And uh, at, at the time, my, it was my wife. She, she just met me and a few months. And I was like, you got to get up. She goes, why? I go, SWAT's here. So now I'm digging out money. I'm throwing out, I'm filling up her pocketbook. I'm like, this is yours. Close it. They can't go into your property. She goes, what do you mean SWAT's here? I go, SWAT's here. It's gonna, any second, the door's going to come off. So now I'm in my underwear. I'm, I go, I, I can't get arrested. My underwear is on. I got to put some clothes on. I don't want to be the laughing stock of Daily News, you know? So now I put some clothes on, I'm putting it on. Now, boom, I hear the door. Duh, 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 duh. They, hear, they say my name. We got a no-knock warrant. The door, bow, comes right off the hinges. So now my dog, he's barking, and I have a little puppy, and the puppy's barking at the door. The little puppy gets taken aback, so now I figure they're going to come in. They knock the door off the hinges, and now they throw percussion grenades in there. 
So now my the puppy thinks it's a ball. So now he's going for it. So I go kick it. So I kicked it into him and it blew up and it sent him across the, the living room. Oh, the little God. puppy, little more tears went flying. He was okay, but, you know, a little, little uh, PST from it, but he was okay after that. My other dog was a big trained dog. It's American Bulldog. He went to, you know, f fighting school, like the training school. You know, he knew how to attack. And so now the dog's ready to attack. I'm like, don't shoot my dog. Because they had all the little red dots on my dog ready to shoot him. So I stepped in front of him, like hugged him. I'm like, don't shoot my dog. Like, you better get that dog in the, somewhere. So I dragged the dog and I lock him in the bathroom. That was right there. And now they got all the dots on me. Don't move. And now my wife, she's coming out. She don't know what's going on. She comes into the kitchen now because they got her, you know. And uh, the, the, now, now in, the, in the living room now, it's dark. All you see is red lights and smoke. And you're choking from the percussion grenades. And that was in the, that was in, you know, you never got woken up until you got woken up by SWAT. Yeah, like no, that, that's know? amazing. It's definitely, uh, it's intense, you know. And all they had to do was call me on the phone. I would have came out. Of course. They didn't have to knock my door they're down, trained, break all my lights you're, outside. You're, you're just deadly. They're, they're brainwashed to some extent that you're this deadly killer, hitman, murderer. Exactly. And it's not the case. So now I didn't know what I was getting arrested for. All right. So now I'm sitting in the van. My whole block is lit up like a Christmas tree. All my neighbors are out. And now I can just see what they're saying. We knew all along. We knew all that. That's what they're saying to themselves, you know? Yeah. Because I was like, strange. you know, play a low key, you know? So now they know something's going on. So now they're like, do you know why you're here? I'm like, no. So I was thinking, what did I do that's warranting this? Or who went bad and old stuff? You yeah. know, so that's what's coming to So I don't know. All of a sudden he pulls a Wii. You know the Nintendo Wii? The game? The, yeah. the electronic game? He pulls it out from behind his, his, his girl. He goes, for this. I go, for the Wii? He goes, yeah. You bought stolen merchandise. I go, you just did all of this from a load of merchandise that I bought? Because I bought I bought merchandise yeah. from somebody. I bought a bunch of, a whole truckload of stuff that was stolen. They came for that. And they go, yeah, we're at your bar now, taking all the TVs down. So they went to my bar and they took all the TVs down. So I was like, so you did all of this. They could be spiteful. For this? Yeah. You could have just called me or just said, listen, be here on Monday. I would have been there. Right. I go, but listen, go plug that thing back in and give me my little tape. Well, that's my favorite cartridge in there. <laughs> all right? Yeah. They didn't do it. No. And uh, that's when I ended up on that case. Right. And uh, Well, it's all, it's all in the rear view mirror now. And, and I got in front of the same judge that I'd been in all the other times. And, and I said, listen, this is a step in the right direction, I told him. Judge Glass, I said, this is a step in the right direction. I went from going around shooting people to buying stolen merchandise. So it's, it's I'm going... Did he buy a, that? He liked that? Kinda. Yeah. Kinda. Yeah. Glass you know? said that's Cause, a, Cause he, he was, yeah. he sat during the trial, so he mm -hmm. heard everything, you know? But let me go back to the screenwriting, cause that's a story and a story okay. that you really like, should hear. Yeah. yeah, we jumped past the screenwriting, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now in prison, you know, you try to get into a routine, you work out a little bit, you, you know, you find something to keep yourself busy. And a guy hands me a screenplay and says, read this. So I read it. I was like, wow, this is how it's done. Like, you see the characters, you see the scenes that they cut and everything, and it, it's a whole different way. I'd rather read a screenplay than a book. Right. Okay? And he goes, I can teach you how to do this. He goes, I, this is what I do. I teach you. I have a class here, and I teach the inmates. So His now, name wasn't you. No, it wasn't okay, you. Okay, because I had you, a guy named you, teach me, and he was a producer this, also. This guy, time. okay, mm -hmm. he was an actual professor from a college that wrote screenplays wow. that, that, and, and taught the basics of screenplay writing. But he had a little black side to him where he, he started to indulge in cocaine and strippers. Uh. So while he was teaching at the college, during lunch break, he was going to rob banks. <laughs> you can't make this up. You can't <laughs> he was make robbing it up. banks yeah. and robbing banks and then it all, it all caught up to him. Yeah, and he, that's how he ended up in federal prison. A, a, a screenwriter professor who was addicted to cocaine and strippers who robbed banks. That's how I learned how to write screenplays. I wrote my book while I was in prison. You wrote a screenplay. I wrote, I wrote screenplays and I wrote the Scarpa Story right. series while I was in prison over 20 years ago. I wrote it. Yeah. And, you know, again, you're in your bid. You mm -hmm. look to do things to kill time and occupy your time because you're forgotten about. See, yeah. if you don't forget the street, mm -hmm. you won't survive right in prison. You know, 
And once you realize that you have no control of anything anymore on the street, mm -hmm. you can't do a good bit until you realize, okay, I'm in here now. This is my world. And, I can't yeah. deal with the outside. No and more. they're stealing from you. They're well, taking yeah, they take everything away. You've forgotten about. They're, they wrote you off. I went through about. Yeah. All my businesses were taken. You, so. You're lucky you got commissary from right. them. You know, just... But you did, and you found uh, solace or salvation in that, and you, you you started thinking of another future. Like I did. Uh, well, the idea for the show that I'm doing now, right, which is a reality show, real life, where me and three street guys, you know, that were in the life. We go around and we investigate all paranormal activities. We hunt down Bigfoots. We, we do investigations on Chupacabra. We do spirit talkers. I have a team of, of experts where we contact the other side. With today's technology, Larry, I'm talking to dead people. I saw your equipment. Yeah. I mean, you got to be a believer. I don't disbelieve. I've had a few little things, but you you come across I'm gonna things. Get so, to that. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get to that. Let's just go back to where I started. Yeah. While 30 years ago in Lowesburg Penitentiary, I was put in a cell with this guy, Paul Ishidi. He's an upstate guy, you know, that was around like their family out there. I think they answered to the Bonanno family in Brooklyn. I think they were like, a, you know, an olive branch out there. And he goes, yeah, you know, I saw a UFO. And I didn't think he was a liar. And how he would tell me the story when he saw it when he was a kid and he chased it down in the forest, him and his friends. And they were all asking each other, did you just see that? Did you just see that? And I heard about this UFO for years. And at the time, I used to read all kinds of books on ghosts, on on aliens, on Bigfoot. On I I I enjoyed those type of books, and I enjoyed true crime, or serial killer books. That, those are the two things that I read, genres. And I told him, I says, one day if we ever get out, you know, because at the time, you know, we went from a life sentence to thirty five years to the thirteen that turned into the fifteen, all because of this whole thing with Greg Scarper and whatnot, which I'm sure you'll get into that in a little while. And I said, if we ever get out, we're going to do a show. We're going to, me and you are going to do a show and we're going to take the whole world on this adventure. And he was like, yeah. I was like, yeah. And, uh, well, 30 years later, here we are. Right. And we you filmed the season. We, fil we filmed well, half a season and we have to film more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it took life. It took life for when we started filming and, and, and it, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's the same paranormal stuff that people are used to but it's done a different way with four street guys that never been done before. Right. And it's interesting just on that alone. Plus it's a reality show, so you're in our life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just three people with a, with a flashlight running around. You know, we, we, we really uh, investigate it. We have a team of scientists. We have a team of experts with equipment. And we have our knowledge of how we used to be in the street to get the job done. Yes. And now we're just doing that same right. knowledge and just applying it to this type of investigation. Mm -hmm. And then you have the camaraderie with all of us and right. the funniness. There'll and, be some comical yeah, parts. It has like, to be. It's like, I call us like when we say it, we're the A-team mm -hmm. of monster hunting. Right. And I'm 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 the colonel, all right? Yeah. Paulie, he's the, before the mob, he was a, a special force Marine guy. He, they used to drop around of a helicopter, kill everybody and go, okay? And then you got John, Philly guy. He's the skeptic. He don't believe anything until he sees it. Like, right. We will have to be abducted by aliens, be on the ship for two, three hours, getting probed, and then he'll look at me on the gurney and say, okay, I believe it now. That's what it would take. Right. And then we have the train wreck of the show, which is Joey, Joey Terra, that's his nickname, and uh, he's the bipolar alcoholic with a master's degree. So there's, there's no telling what comes yeah, out of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah he's that, he, he wanted to come to this. I couldn't allow him in Vegas because he would have been dead within 24 hours the way he is. Yeah. But, city. Yeah, yeah. He would have been dead. We, there would have been no more filming. We would have to be contacting him through the spirit boxes that we have to get him on the show still and talk to him in the afterlife. I would have brought That's him to amazing. Vegas. And one of, the, one of the scenes that you filmed, even the camera people saw something and everybody's hair was... I mean, I remember hearing that. It's amazing. I got so freaked out at this one spot in this location where there was a lot of death. There used to be a, a burial ground for all five families. And I went back to this spot with the whole crew and we, uh, we did an investigation. And again, the camera people that were hired to come film us, they never met us before. They thinking, oh, look at these guys running around. What are they gonna do? When we started our thing, they stopped the cameras, pulled me to the side and said, Frankie, is this real? Is this really coming out of these boxes now? I said, this is all real stuff right now. And they were shocked. Right. They were all freaked out. The guy that holds the boom, he wanted to leave. 
He wanted to just walk walk back to the truck. He was so scared because right. in order to get good readings, you got to do it at 3 a.m., like the witching out. Really? So, yeah, we, we were in the back of this one wooded area, desolate, creepy as, as creepy could be, and we made contact to multiple spirits, different languages, women, children, you know, and one of them, it was my father popped up. And that's when everybody's hair stood up because my father died and I have his ashes at home. And you could do a reading through ashes with the equipment we have. But I didn't bring him, but I brought my wife. And I'll get into that also. And she ended up popping up there. And now when we take the, the footage and the, the recordings, when we take it from that night and everybody's hearing this stuff come out, there's other footage that sounds like groans and growls. We sent it to a woman that we use in uh, North Dakota, Cynthia. And she sits there in the studio and she starts pulling things up. Now, she never met me before. She sends me back what was said. Okay, now John the skeptic, who don't believe nothing, right? He's holding the equipment. We're in the one spot where there's a lot of people, bones are probably right around us mm -hmm. in the ground. And he, he goes, he, he asked the spirit, do you know anyone present here? So now we're all waiting for an answer. And all of a sudden you hear, ah, like that, right? Like everybody's hair was like this. I was like, and when she broke it down the next day and sent me the, the what was said, it said, it's Sam, my father. I'm here, Frankie. Okay. She had no clue who no you, I clue no who names, I was, nothing, nothing not wow. on social media, nothing like that. This, this pulled it out mm -hmm. from the ground. How did she pull that out from the growl? Now, at the time that the growl was taking place, we have these ultraviolet, ultraviolet spectrum cameras going around mm -hmm. that pick up stuff that the eye really can't see. And as that's being said, the picture, remember the picture I sent yeah, you? Yeah, you sent okay. it to me, yes. I looked like Ghost Rider. Mm -hmm. My head was on fire. Yeah, wasn't there something in the woods too, or is that another picture? That picture, mm -hmm. the skeptic John looks at it now and goes, I, I don't want to make you right, Frank, but... This is like a disfigured face of my mother. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. So we freaked everybody out that night. And again, the next day when I went home, like I was freaked out that night when I went home, but when I went home the next day and this lady sent me the recordings and everything, I really got freaked out of my house. I went outside and I, I got a lot of cars. I put all the headlights on. I turned them all at my house the whole night. All the cars were running with the, with the lights on. <laughs> all right. And, and the next day I was calling, I was Googling places to get Waxed. I wanted all the hair off my body, you know, because it was just yeah. like you're, you're tingling. That's, yeah, that's that's eerie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that was a disaster doing that one. I was spas. I didn't know it was the Chinese spas. I was like, "Do you do hair waxing?" Yeah, we do hair waxing. I was like, and I went to the hair. I wasn't a hair waxing. Right. It was something totally different. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it, we we bring a whole different way of looking at it to the table, especially with our Bigfoot investigations. Right. You, you have know? people that. So a Bigfoot numerous times. I have people that I come in contact with that saw... F I got one woman that's seen five Bigfoots in her life. Three at once and two separate ones in different states. For some reason, they attract to her. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but she's very believable. She's big in the Bigfoot world. You know, and I have one group of scientists and people in the Bigfoot world that think Bigfoot is like the missing link that came from here from somewhere and just didn't evolve but it's very intelligent. Then I have another group of scientists and actually people who work for NASA that think it's something out of space. Wow. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. And, I, and I've been doing a lot of research, talking to a lot of different people, and I don't, the government knows about it. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you do kill one, you end up with an IRS case. <laughs> yeah, you get fined and you end up getting all kinds of IRS cases. That's how they first get into you. Wow. Yeah, they know all about it. And it's like a, a gray area for them. I'll make it back to Bigfoot. You know, you have all these researchers in the Bigfoot community and they're trying to get like a number of how many of them are on earth. This, they, they, they swear and they, they go by their calculation. There's 2 million of these things on earth, all across the earth. How do they not get spotted more when often? It, I mean, they live in caves and you can go into a cave where a bear is in there. In that cave, they'll take the bear out. They'll probably eat it. And then they'll dig out a spot in that cave, whatever they can do, they'll dig out a spot, you won't even know they're there. And they'll have a home in there. 
or they'll be so far off the beaten path. Like say if you have like woodlands and you go hundred miles into it where nobody goes and they'll have a nest there. But if you get too close, they let you know. The first thing they do is throw a rock at you, you know? And they do a thing called the bluff charge, where if, the, if you're ever in a you know, forest and a Bigfoot does run at you, you, you have to go like in the fetal position on the floor and be like very timid. Because if he's having a bad day, he will kill you. Hmm. And then I have other people who I interviewed personally that actually seen them. And you look at these people, you hear what's coming them out of their mouth. They don't sound like, they don't act like a crackpot or a crazy person. They really believe what they saw. And it's very huge. And we did a couple of investigations in, in, a, in a piece of state game land where there was three sightings in a 20 mile radius. So other people would just go get their flashlights and go there thing. oh, you see something, go in the forest. We don't do that. The military works with the state game lands. And by, by that, what I mean is the drone pilots, before you can go to another country and drop a bomb, you have to do a certain amount of hours of drone flying here. And they work with the state game lands where they fly over the state game lands at night and the thermal imaging picks up how many deers are there, how many bear, how many turkeys, how many rabbits, how many little birds. And then there's the big thermal image with a question mark. They don't know what that is. It's too big to be an animal. And I, I have a drone pilot that I know who right. does this. And we got some footage from him and we went right to where the geo coordinates put where this thing is. And when I got there, Larry, you would be a believer if I would have took you because nothing made sense. There was like, just imagine taking a little mini bulldozer mm -hmm. and bulldozing a pair knocking trees down and everything, but without the tracks. That's what it was like near this one spot where it would drink probably. It would be there between three and 5 a.m. in the morning in this one spot on multiple occasions throughout the last 30 days of the footage that I had. But what about footprints? I, that found, would be I found one. Now, where this one spot where it says where it was, we go there and we're looking around and looking around. Finally, we find something. It was so big that I passed it three times because I never thought it was a foot. Oh, a foot. Yeah, unbelievable. It was giant. Yeah. Okay. So now it's right near the near the like it's like a creek yeah. that where this thing goes probably drinks or does something there. And I found this print and I put everybody over to me looking at it, and we're like, "Is that a toe?" Is it, and we're looking. It was so large. Amazing. But it's in a spot where it's in, it's mud with a lot of leaves. So a lot of the prints were not close. The stride was like, like from like, say like we're right here, just go a stride, it'd be seven feet away. Like that's how big this thing is. It was 20, 30 feet, 20 feet, 15 well, feet, I don't know. Well, it, it's, it was just so humongous. Now when I'm looking at the trees that are knocked down, this thing was big. It had to be like between 10 and 14 feet high. You know, and I found fur in a tree that I took a sample from. So again, we do stuff like that. Right. It's we go right to where they are mm -hmm. by the thermal imaging. And what's I the name of the show? Mobsters vs. Monsters. Mobsters vs. Monsters. Yeah, it's catchy. Yeah, yeah that's, and, that's you know why I use that why I picked that? You know, when we got indicted the you know, <laughs> during the war, you know, you know, and the government labeled us mobsters. We never actually called ourselves a gangster or a mobster. We, right. we, you know, you don't do that. No. The government labels you that. Yeah. And I never liked that name, but now I like it for the title. Yeah. It's catchy. Right, right. Yeah, just Mobsters change the B in the end. It's, it's so close, yeah. Yeah, show all me right, right. I'll cook Thank something, you. all right? Thank you. Perfect. Well, Frankie, good to see you. Thanks for having me here. I wish you all the success with your show. I appreciate that. Thank you. TV needed something like this. Great. Great to hear. Thank you.